Hey, I'm Munya Chihuahua, satirist and six-time winner of Britain's Bushiest Eyebrows, and I am great company. Have you ever heard about the dog called Hatchy? Me, personally, I don't really like dogs too much. What? Because... You don't like dogs? First of all, they do stink. Let's, let's be real, they do. Yeah. And I even so know do someone's... humans. Okay, you know what puts me off dogs, for real? Yeah. Because I know it's a big red flag if someone's not a dog person. Listen, I had a dog, yeah? Mm. I'm not even going to tell you what happened to the dog, because every time I say it, people it, it, people lose their minds. But what happened to the I dog? I didn't do anything to what it. What happened to the dog? Well, I would decide whether I want to tell you at the end of the podcast. Okay. But... So you're gonna so you're gonna say this is a cliffhanger to the end. Well, maybe. Oh, quite nice. So but, that will um, keep people to the end. I said it on Taskmaster. They they cut it out of the show because of how much shock was in the room. So it's not like a grim you, story. It's you drowned more like, it. No, no, no. It's not even that grim. It's just unbelievable to hear what happened to the dog. But you've got to tell me. <laughs> you've got to tell me first what happened to the dog. No, I this I will wait. You know okay. this is you know you have to make the audience wait, isn't it? Very true. I re-listened to your off menu one. Man, I didn't. Yeah. It's so good. I didn't know anything about that format, so I thought I was doing it totally right. It's so good. And then we got to the end, and I was like, "Wow, I've only just told you my starter." Maybe we should set up a food. Yeah, me and you. Should we do that? Call it on menu. What would it? What would the concept be? I need to get back to you on that. Yeah, because the IP, you know, I don't want to be giving it out in a room that's, full of people. Do you know what I mean? True. I, I, I totally get that. I mean, it just has to be about you know. You, there's so many questions you can ask about food. Yeah. You could do the whole thing of, you know, what's the one food you'd eat on a desert island? Sweet or salty? I'd always pick sweet. I have a massive sweet tooth. So you would pick sweet on mm-hmm. a desert island? Yeah, million percent. Are you? Because then if I ever desire salt, I just have a bit of seawater and that's that's going to put me off for months. Okay, so let me just, let me just get this straight. So you'd go to a desert island mm. mm-hmm. and... Well, I wouldn't go there. Oh, so how you... If I was trapped there. Right. But I would know how to survive on a desert island because I watch so many survival videos. Okay, well, here's a question for you. You're allowed mm-hmm. three bits of survival kit. Yeah. To take to a desert island. What are you taking? All I need to survive yeah. is a piece of plastic. Mm-hmm. Like and, a, so a ruler? And, no, 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 no. Oh. Like a sheet of plastic. Oh, so like a bigger ruler? What, you, no. You're obsessed. Oh, at school, did you have a straight ruler? Did you have one of them bendy ones that you slap people with? I had, I had this, I had the bendy one, but I also had the straight one. I had both. Nah, I love the slap rulers. You see, this is how I know you were living. You had both rulers. Yeah. We, most of us, we had to make a decision, you know, and that shaped our characters. But personally, so if I was on a desert island, yeah, you get a sheet of plastic. Okay. Mm-hmm. You dig a big hole on the beach, which actually, as men, we are naturally inclined to do. It. We'll, we'll come back to that. Okay. You dig a hole on the beach. And you put a sheet of plastic over it, okay? Yeah. And then you put stones in the middle of that sheet of plastic, so it's sort of sagging into the hole. Because yeah. when the thing is sagging into the hole, mm-hmm. uh, condensation. I've left out an important bit of this. Yeah, I thought. Uh, yeah. Never mind. Forget no, that. No, no, no. Let's but start, you no. see, in the heat of the moment, I would know what to do. Yeah. But basically, what I was going to say is, you put leaves underneath. They evaporate. No, but don't rush it. Oh, no, we're, we're trying to survive here. Is, this, need... is this part of the podcast? Yes, this is. Oh, right. Oh, okay. damn. sorry. I thought this was still like icebreaker. Chat. No, 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 no. Right, this right, is right. This is it. This is it. Right, we're on a desert island. Yeah. We find some leaves. Just quickly, we've, how have we got there? We were stranded. Just We were stranded. Up. Ryanair flight, dodgy, Bermuda Triangle, we're stranded. Everyone else died. Well, I don't want to say that, but they're def- we can't see them. <laughs> <laughs> so what we do is we take some leaves. Yeah. Loads of leaves and we put them in a hole. Got it. We stretch some plastic over the hole. Sorry, who's dug the hole? You and I together. Me, well, I didn't even know you were on the island. I am, but I'm if with you. you I'll probably kill you. You would what? Because otherwise I have to now keep you alive. Yeah. And I, are you good at survival? Unbelievable. Um, mm. un- unbelievable. I don't I'm really trust people with like those beaded bracelets. <laughs> because it means that there's not enough danger in your life to even risk them coming undone. This is Whenever, true. When I wear a beaded bracelet, instantly yeah. it, it disintegrates. So we, you've got the plastic sheet. Yes. You've, you've got some, you've dug a hole. Yeah. You've got half a plastic bottle. Yeah. You're collecting the condensation, so the water's going into the bottle. From the leaves, yeah. From the leaves. In the hole. You, yeah. In the hole. What are you doing next for survival? Um, no, well, first thing you... Well, next thing you've got to do is make a fire and then a shelter. How so you water, do... fire, shelter. Sorry, is that... So, sorry, this... So, it's, so stop, look, listen, live. That's, like, for the road. Yeah. And then, so when you water, go... Water, fire, shelter. Of course, because you have to drink, because you get thirsty. You have to make fire so you can be warm and cook and then shelter so you can, you know, protect from the elements. How are you making fire? Um, I'll probably just get some sort of flint. From where? You look like a man who has like lots of different bits of wood on him. 
you know what I mean? Like lots of small pieces, like a bit of sage and then the bracelets and whatnot. So something we'll be able to craft a fire from. <laughs> Do you know any survival tips? Yeah, um, I know how to make a catapult. Okay, go on, which is? Which is a stick with a... Have you ever watched Dennis Venice? I is mean, it, I had catapults in Zimbabwe because they weren't illegal. But in England, when I came over, suddenly they're like, no, this is a weapon. So I then had to get rid of them all. But did you... Okay, here we go. So did you have a, a proper catapult? Yeah. Oh, the one that you... With it thick rests, rubber. And it rested on your arm and you put your arm through it. No, and no, you no. Back. So you hold the stem. You're talking about some next sniper rifle catapults, which we did not have that technology in Zimbabwe. So in, in Zimbabwe, was it was it handmade by you or did you go and buy it in a shop? There was a market... Pl- no, no, not a shop. There was a marketplace that sold them. Different, different thickness of... Different girth of elastic depending on the power of the shot. Get out of here. Of course. Why really? wouldn't there be? Was there really? Of course. And what the, the depending on the power of the catapult, the more expensive it was? Yeah, because some of them were so thick. If you shot something, it can literally go through any any su- substance. Give it, uh, give it, what was it like growing up in Zimbabwe? I mean, growing up in Zimbabwe was just the greatest thing ever. You know? Really? Because w- what was so um, uh, fantastic about Zimbabwe was it was the total embodiment of what being a child should be, right? When you're a kid, you're adventurous. You know, kids do weird stuff. They're always falling and climbing and jumping. In England, it's hard to do that because school finishes, it's dark, you have to go home and you have to sit on an iPad. In Zimbabwe, you can do whatever you want. Climb trees, go on mad adventures. You know, I've done it all. I remember the example I always tell people as a sort of indication of if you had a thought, you could do the thought was I remember I saw bungee jumping on TV once and I said to my sister, let's try bungee jumping. So I climbed in a tree with a rope, just a normal rope, tied it around my waist, tied some around the tree and then just jumped out the tree. (laughs) Now, obviously when I fell now, it just (laughs) cracked. My ribs were just hanging on this rope and my sister has to lift me whilst we quickly asked my dad to come in and tie the rope. If I wanted to do it, I could do it right as a kid. But hang on, can I just, isn't that like what, growing up as a kid back in like the 90s, that's what it was just like. True. We didn't have distract. We had no iPads. We had no nothing. We could, we just, our minds were our iPads. True, but you also, no, no you're right. You're right. Because, you know, kids back then had adventures as well. But yeah. um, think about the terrain as well. Think about the weather. Yeah. You know, if it's always sunny, you're always outside. There is not really any winter. And, you know, you're, you're able to climb trees and you're able to, okay, so gardens, for example, is a good example. In, in England, a garden's quite the luxury, I'd say, for many people, right? Yeah. Uh, but in Zimbabwe, because there's so much land, it's almost like everyone has a garden. And, um, you know, our garden, for example, we didn't have a wall at the end of it, meaning it just sort of spilled out into this vast terrain. So we could basically decide where to build the wall, right? So when I remember when we first moved to the house, the house that we thought we were going to live in forever, right? So the garden is so vastly overgrown, anyone can hide in it, right? <laughs> so my dad said, we need to do a controlled fire. Now, of course, none of us knew how to do a controlled fire. So my dad and his two brothers were there and we just set fire to the garden. So it's gone up in flames. This grass is burning like mad to the point where at the end, all of the ground was black. And sure enough, we found little nests where people had, there was no people in the grass at that time, but where people previously had just camped out. You serious? Yeah. Yeah. Because there was no one living at the house before. And then obviously, you know, you build your Jura wall and then that becomes your, your, your land. Um, when you left Zimbabwe, sad, upsetting. I, yeah. I mentioned before, but like, but really, how like because that because you you basically you speak so beautifully about it, mm. and obviously it's such a you did it. You've done your documentary about it. Yeah. It must have been pretty shit at times. Oh yeah, we you know I didn't have any concept of the future in the sense of I thought look we're probably going we'll probably come back. As it transpires in you know the first of the documentaries which I made, which was about Robert Mugabe really the reason we had to leave because Mm. of the political and economic upheaval he caused uh when we left it was pretty much permanent could you feel the tension at the time as a young kid in zimbabwe um my parents did a good job of not necessarily showcasing it to me i mean i'd hear stories of violence and stuff but uh put it this way i had a big ice cream tub full of pocket money right which i'd collect let's say i had about 400 dollars, which is nothing in zimbabwe I remember my mum coming into my room and I just put like another bit of money in there and she went, it's totally pointless what you're doing because tomorrow it'll be worth nothing. That was the extent of inflation to the point where inflation, I mean, I forget the stat, it's in the doc, but 
it was at one point you could go into, say, your Sainsbury's equivalent, buy a loaf of bread for two pounds. And by the time you walk over to the till, it's 10 pounds. Get out of here. Yeah. No way. The, 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 the only reason that they had to change currency to the US dollar is because they ran out of space on calculators to calculate the figures of things. That's how much inflation was. It was within the billion percent. That is mad. Mm -hmm. So naturally, so my, my parents, you can imagine if your money is literally devaluing by the day, by the second even, they spent everything they had on the tickets to come to England. And um, so when we arrived in England, we will stay with my grandma mm -hmm. and then my dad would hitchhike around different parts of England to see where it would be safe for us to grow up. Wow. What's really interesting is that... Um, wow, that's amazing. You know, my dad, uh, he had this, um, you know, he would he would do what he needed to, you know, he would like work all of these jobs in order to, then to try and hitchhike. And then when he would go to the place, he would, he would look around and be like, try and speak to landlords. Obviously, you need to show proof of earnings, mm. which they didn't have. So he was so terrified that I would fall into like a gang or whatever. So he was like, I just need to get my son in a, in a good place. I remember going with my dad to these schools and he said to me, look, we're going to put you in really smart clothes to go and meet this deputy head teacher. So we went to the school. I, bro, I, I was dressed to the nines walking around this school. Everyone's looking at me like a madman. And I've sat down with this teacher. I've like memorized all my long words, da, da, da. Proper being like, you know, it'd be such a pleasure to come to this school, Mrs. Hammersley. It would be the greatest honor of my life. You know, really trying to, you know, blag it. And sure enough, uh, you know, we got into the school and then we had to rebuild from there. Um, because literally, if you imagine moving to a place, yeah. i.e. Zimbabwe, and being like, this is our home now. This is our life. This is where we're going to live forever. We're going to build our dreams and our family here. Then next thing you know, you're moving with nothing. Um, for my parents, it would have been really tough. For me, personally, I don't, you know, I, I was just enjoying life. You know, as long as I was with my sisters having fun, it was cool. Yeah. I think it was difficult for them. It, it, what I find incredible is that can't imagine the sort of passion and desire and willpower you have just to look after and protect your family. What's interesting is that oftentimes, you know, uh, African fathers sacrifice so much in order to, uh, you know, for the self-preservation of their, their kids and for their kids to do well. They tap out of everything else. So like my dad doesn't even know who Beyonce is. Do you know how crazy that is? If you said to my dad, you know who Beyonce is? He'd be like, uh, nope. He just has no reference of popular culture. So it's a weird one because I can't talk to him about anything other than stuff that's really deep. I once tried to take him to Avatar, which because I thought, you know, it's three hours long. Yeah. You have to understand part of it by the time we get to the end. And and in Avatar, they constantly mention this place, Pandora. You remember mm. to the point where people got Pandora blues because they felt so much in love with this place. And we got to the end of the film and I thought, he's got to take us something from this. And I said to him, Dad, what did you think of Pandora? And he went, who, who is she again? I thought, no, nah, it's a lost cause. <laughs> I saw that you kind of give all of your credit to being the entertainer that you are down to pretty much your dad. Well, my, so specifically my granddad. I mean, academically, yes, my dad, but my granddad was the funny one. And he bought you a joke book, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, that's right. My granddad was a cool dude. And like his, all of him and his brothers, they were like the guys. So like when I used to go the walk, when I used to go on a walk with my granddad through the village, all the old ladies were like, hi, Brian. And I was like, yo, I want to be like that guy. You know, <laughs> then, my, then my uncle, <laughs> my uncle Doug, who again is a legend, you know, he used to be apparently amazing at every sport. And I remember my granddad would tell this story one time, like they came out the cinema or whatever. And there was this huge circle. Yeah. And these guys were beating up this one guy with knuckle dusters. Imagine that. And my uncle Doug stepped in there finished them both off, bang, 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 dumb. And I was like, duck, duck, duck. <laughs> and I'm like, what? It's an unbelievable <laughs> movie. <laughs> and then people say that my granddad used to tell me this story about how at the swimming gala, there was like a race and my Uncle Doug, uh, they blew the whistle or whatever and then the race started and my Uncle Doug disappeared under the water and everyone's like, where's Doug, man? Where's Doug? I hope he's okay. And he just appears at the finish line. <laughs> you know, I'm like, up. yo, I need <laughs> to be just... like Doug. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Well, because you're swimming underwater. So, okay, sorry. <laughs> Just appeared. Yes. He did his I, whole length underwater. I, sorry, and he, go, he walks outside the cinema. I love this. And Doug meets up everyone with Doug and others. And even the crowd don't know who he is. Start chanting, <laughs> Doug, Doug, Doug. Yeah, this because is, he was a local legend. I reckon he's called Doug. Doug, <laughs> Doug. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. So I wanted to be like, you know, I, as as a kid, I'm like, you know, they they were that my male role models. So important to have in life. For sure. But but when you're beyond important. Mm. And if you don't really have that, you don't really understand what it is to sort of become a man in lots of ways. Mm -mm. It's very interesting because, you know, you can obviously scrutinize what that definition is. Yeah. Um, for me, I think maybe you would have the, you know, the desire to have a male role model is just to begin to shape some form of moral compass. Totally. Because then technically you can separate that from any sort of traits of masculinity. It can be more like, can you teach me or do I have someone who can teach me to be a good person? Mm -hmm. um, you know, to instill values of helping others or being polite or having respect for boundaries. When I, it, you know, if and when I become a dad, those are the kind of things that I will aspire to do, especially if I have a son. Of course, you know, I'm thinking about, oh my God, like how do I create a good young man? And most of what I can hope to do, uh, that that needs to be my priority before being like, how can I create like a really strong macho man? That's that's That needs to fall second to, totally. how do I create a respectful human? Mm. And I know? think, and that's what we need more of. Your, your documentaries that you're doing at the moment, you obviously did one about Zimbabwe. Yeah. Now you're doing one about North Korea. Mm -hmm. Or oh, it's out at the moment. Um, just something a bit more lighthearted, I think. Yeah, know? yeah, of course. You just, but you, but again, w what you do is you're, it, it's so right. You, as you said, it's such a heavy topic that you have to put these sketches and sort of entertainment in it because otherwise it becomes too, mm. too much. When, do you worry about reviews or anything like that when things come out? Being a Zimbabwean and having had my dad's feedback, if I hear anything remotely bad about something, I'm like, it's a total failure. If it's not five stars, it's a failure. In your eyes? Of, of course. So that's not a good way to think. I remember at GCSE, I got six A stars, four A's. I bro, you would have thought that I literally failed every subject. The way I was in the shower, like an Usher music video, hammering the wall. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> that's literally just the way that I'm built. So that, that creates your drive. Yeah, it creates my drive. But, you know, people around me, my friends say, look, you can't go through life like that. That's just going to get in the way of you being a grateful person. So... When we made the documentary, what I spent the week doing, and I will read the reviews eventually just to learn and become better. But I said, look, in the first week, I'm just going to take a moment to be like, cool, I got to make a doc. Yeah. I got to go to South Korea and Switzerland and I got to study and I got to meet all these amazing people who shared very real stories with me. That's got to be worth something before I, I read someone's review. So I'm just it, absorbing that. Then when I'm in a good place, I'm going to check out the reviews, try and pick what bits I can learn from and then move on. And why do you want to do the docs? I want to do the docs because, number one, I'm interested in politics, as you know. Yeah. Um, actually, one thing that I've become very apparent to me after doing both of these documentaries now is dictatorships are things that we wrongly and arrogantly assume happen in poor places and to dumb people, quote unquote, right? Because if I said to you in England, do you think we'll ever have a dictator? You might be like, what are you on about? England, have a dictator. What about America? Nah, man, come on, we're America, we're England. Donald Trump is saying stuff that could very easily fall straight out of a dictator's handbook. I've seen a tweet of him saying, you know, maybe we should just have one like really rough day where there's like no law enforcement and maybe that will help stuff. Bro, that's a purge. You're talking about the purge. Yeah. For him to have, what is it? 34? No. Uh, he tweeted that. Yeah. That with his, no, he didn't even tweet. It's a video footage. You can go and look at it. Just type in rough day, Donald Trump. Him talking about the fact he has so many felonies and we're all just cool with it. And it's like, nah, yeah, yeah, it's, it's fine. He can, he can operate. The fact that if anyone and anyone says, look, this thing about you has been said, it is true. Here are the statistics. Here are the pictures. Here are the words. And he can just go, that ain't true. I never did that. Boris did that as well. Those are all things that dictators do. And so the membrane between us and them by us and them, them by which I mean, you know, your Zimbabwe's, your North Korea's, whatnot, is thinner than you think. And that's why it's really interesting for me, even personally, just to investigate that to see how many parallels are there and how close are we. You know, any president saying stuff like, I might even scrap the judiciary, judiciary when I come to power because, you know, they're a bit pesky, aren't they? You're removing checks and balances. And the number one prerequisite, prerequisite to be a dictator is to have no checks and balances. So... It's a, uh, it's a, uh, the documentary, as much as they are just interesting investigations, could also very much be a foreshadowing for 
the direction the West is heading in. What, what do you think, American election coming up, what do you think is going to happen? Well, I hope Kamala Harris wins. Yeah. You know, what's really interesting is that in politics, if you express wanting one person not to win, the instant assumption is that you are tot- you totally love the other person, you know. I don't, I, don't, I don't know enough about Kamala Harris, to be honest. And I don't know tons about Keir Starmer, even though I wanted him to win over the Conservatives, right? Politics, one thing I was taught is that you have to understand it's not even, in most cases, because it's so innately flawed, it's not even about picking who the best person for the job is or who the person you like the most is. It's like a choice between the impalatable and the utterly insufferable. You know, it's the lesser of two evils, particularly in a two-party system, as in America, as in the UK. So I just honestly feel like there is more to be said for a a convicted felon being able to rule one of the most powerful countries on the planet. I just think the implications of that would be terrible. And I'd also ask any Trump supporter, just out of genuine interest as opposed to an attack, if Obama had one felony against him uh, or an, or even close to the amount Trump had, would there not be riots in the streets saying this guy should have never been president? Again, not a perfect president, not a perfect man, but it's just a question I'd love to ask a Trump supporter. Growing up in Zimbabwe with that just landscape and just the the, the amount of space you can have to go and experience everything and just have Mm. those, that is what childhood is about. Mm. It's about just having those adventures. So then when you move to England, you move to Norfolk, that's a culture shock. Oh yeah, for sure. Man, I can't even imagine. How old were you when you came to England? I was probably about 12 and it was a culture shock. You know, in Zimbabwe would say stuff, you know, when I told people I was moving to England, everyone would say stuff like, no, don't go to England. I've heard that they throw chairs at teachers. That was like mythology. <laughs> Literally two weeks into moving to, two weeks into moving to England in a music lesson, someone threw the chair at the teacher. Get out of here. And if I say to you, do you, does, do you know anyone who was in a school where they threw a chair at the teacher? Of course, in England, that's like your <laughs> rite of passage, isn't it? For Jesus Christ, is nodding her head. <laughs> <laughs> so look, you know, if I say this, as even though I'm born in Britain, if I say this, it will, it will be deemed as a criticism of England. But, you know, England can be a very cruel place, really, in terms of even how, you know, kids are. And I think it's shaped, you know, psychologically, my, my degree is in psychology. And, you know, we would describe England as an individualistic culture, which realistically is a slightly scaled down version of the American dream. In America, it's amped up to the to the ninth degree, which is if you fail, it's your fault. Right. Mm. In England, it's perhaps less so about that. It's more shrouded, but it's certainly a case of it's your job to be successful. And if someone falls over in front of you, sort of not your problem. It's about you. Right. In Zimbabwe, it's a collectivist society. So it's people are happy to see each other do well. You know, when someone begins to climb the ranks of success or whatever in their discipline, people are very excited for that. You know, even on an academic level in school, you know, in American movies where the jocks like the football player and they've got their cool varsity jacket. In Zimbabwe, being smart in school was the equivalent of being a jock. Was it really? To the point where people would get detentions in class because the teacher would ask a question. Everyone would shoot their hands up and people would be clicking just to be able to answer the question. And the teacher would go, don't click at me, you're in detention for wanting to answer a question. So when I moved to England now and I put my hand up in lesson, I'm the only person to put my hand up. Then sure enough, people start calling me boffin, da-da-da. I'm thinking, what's a boffin? Sounds like that thing freaking Harry Potter catches in Quidditch, right? And I'm like, what a snitch. It's such a very, yeah, but there's boffins and quibbles and snitches and right. Quibbles. So <laughs> my point is the my first survival instinct as a teenager in England yeah. was to hide any and all talent I had for fear of being bullied or ridiculed. <gasps> so you, you suppressed everything. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. So I would try to answer questions less. Or if I did, I was like, cool, it's a Hail Mary. I'm going to get bullied for it, but I really want to answer the question because I know I'm uninterested. So, you know, that was the biggest culture shock. It was like, you know, don't, don't openly succeed. And sure enough, we do see it. That's hard though, because you're unlearning something that you've learned, which as 12 years old, 13 years old, that's tricky. Because yeah. you, you, you have to become so good at your own psyche and understand other people's psyche straight away mm-hmm. and go, shit, okay, this is my protective nature. I need to now not do everything that I was doing before, mm-hmm. which is mad. Yeah. And, you know, if to participate in class or to be good at, say, a sport or music or whatever, you know, I never really think it's uh, to, it's never to the spite of others. It's more so just realizing there's a thing that you're, you know, good at and want to grow in but uh so often i think it's taken as an attack on others uh you know like in a in a i remember in a p lesson we had to do this circuit 
and I, a guy called, I did 10 press-ups, right? It was like a, yeah, you had to move from station to station. I did 10 press-ups. Mm. Then a guy called Callum did about 14 or whatever. Oh. Then I said, oh, I'm, I can do another lap. So I went round and this time I did 20. Obviously, I'm gonna, I'm gonna 100%. want to try, and, and and bro, it was like I committed a war crime. Everyone was like, "Man, man, why are you trying to do twenty? Why is he being Callum? Man, Callum did twelve, and you should have let him have that." And um, it was this thing of like, "Wait, are we meant to? What am I meant to do in life right now? Like, am I meant to try and do my best, or am I meant to try and do deliberately less?" That was the hardest learning as a kid. That's a weird. I never thought of it that way in the UK because because America, the America language, America dream, right? Is like, we want you to succeed. Oh my God, he's driving a car. He's talking about how much money his business made. It's, it's that kind of sort of attitude. The UK sort of philosophy is a little bit like, oh, we want you to do well, as you said, but you don't. we don't want you to become a show off. And as soon as you start doing well, oh, and we don't like it that you're doing so well. Mm. And that sort of does, it suppresses us as individuals because we don't really want to do that. But it's surely, you're right, as kids, you you want to be competitive. You want to be the best. You want to do the things. But then if the what is it? Is it a jealousy thing within the class? Yeah, but that thing even to describe it as a show off, right? If you watch anyone, and I'm talking, you know, a pianist or an athlete or whatever, in their flow state, the nature of a flow state is such that it it appears effortless, yeah, and totally thoughtless, and it's it's like water the way that it flows. Naturally, a person's going to look like they're showing off in many cases. You know, the flourish of somebody doing something well. You know, if you're watching a pianist and they're lost in the music and they're moving in certain ways, you might be like, oh, this guy loves himself or, or she loves herself. When actually, it's just the full embodiment of what they're doing. You know, similarly, like, um, you know, like boxers, for example. Mm. Charisma sells fights. So you want, to, you want a meek boxer. You want a boxer who's like, I don't know, maybe I'll beat him. I'm not sure. Maybe I'll be able to knock him out. I'm the greatest in the world. You know, it doesn't, those two things are not synonymous. It doesn't, it doesn't so like, you're like Muhammad Ali. So Would Muhammad Ali be memorable if he'd gone around being like, well, I'm not sure. I think I could knock him out. I'm not sure. We'll have to see, won't we, Larry? Do you know what I mean? It's like, that. You know, Larry. it's part of the, you know, it's part of the, of the game. I, I agree with you in the sense that, you know, arrogance is not an enticing quality, but, um, you know, Charisma is something that we all think we want, you know, even within a political framework, you know, the biggest criticism, well, one of the initial biggest criticisms of our current prime minister, Keir Starmer, is that he's so bland, he's so boring. Mm. And what people say they loved about Tony Blair is that how charismatic he was and he had the it factor. But then uh, if Keir Starmer became that, he would entice his own brand of hatred for that. So Isn't I guess that it's weird just though? Mixed, well, it's weird. And I'm just saying that as when I moved here, it was something I really struggled to understand. It's strange how we, uh, we have to find a box for individuals. Look, everyone's different. Yeah. Um, some people, you know, every, everyone is different. Everyone's on their own path. And some people, for example, can achieve, you know, it, it can move mountains through their meekness. And it's part of their you know, their innate charm and, and who they are. And, you know, we should totally celebrate that. I think we should just be open to celebrating all different manifestations of a person's talent and drive. You know, um, if you're from a family, you know, for, for example, most African families will encourage this extreme over ambition and over achievement. And so when people enter a culture that is not an African culture, and they want to continue to do that. It's not for any desire to show off. It's because of this underlying pressure of, oh, no, I have to be the best I can be, otherwise my dad won't love me, you know? <laughs> so it's- It's um, crazy it goes back to that, every, isn't it? Yeah. If In school, if you miss Pavin Zimbabwe, you get the cane, right? Yeah. And there was different thicknesses of cane. So I never got the cane at school because I was very, in, I was, I was very clever to being mischievous only behind the teacher's back, right? I was actually head boy at school. I was actually head boy twice. Shall but I? I was also quite naughty. Wait, sorry, sorry. So you were head boy twice. Mm -hmm. How does that work? So let me tell you the, in Zimbabwe, again, this is one thing I love about Zimbabwe, right? In Zimbabwe, it was like, it was like the tri Wizards tournament, yeah, when they wanted to select a leader. So what they did is this. They said, right, when you're in year seven, we're going to send you all away to this camp. There's no adults there. There's just older students, either from a different school or who volunteer at the camp, right? Yeah. When you go to this camp, you'll be separated into groups with other people in your year group. Mm -hmm. And you will be monitored and observed across the week to see which of your leaders. We will determine from there who will be prefects, deputy head boy, head boy, head girl, da da da. So I get to this camp. It's in the middle of like nowhere. It's not the jungle, but it's certainly rural, mm. right? There's snakes and stuff. Yeah. 
the girls would sleep in like these huts, right? And the boys, we slept in the roof of this ginormous hut. So we just slept in this attic, right? On these thin mattresses. And I was divided into a team. Some people from the year group I knew, some I didn't. And the challenges were mental. Because in Zimbabwe, there's no health and safety. Your parents don't sign a little form saying, oh, please look after my kid. It's just like, yeah, whatever happens, happens. See you at the end of it. So one of the challenges was they took us to a crocodile farm and the guy literally showing us around only had one arm because the other one had been death rolled off. And they took us into this room which had this huge basin of crocodiles, this huge pool, right? And a very thin plank leading over the pool. And it was filled, not with big crocodiles, but with baby crocodiles, like toddler crocodiles. So if they bit you, they'll still mess you up. Still scary. Ain't going to pull off a limb, but they hurt you. Just literally clambering over each other. And they said, right, if you're brave enough, walk over the plank. Now, there's no guardrails. (laughs) Are you? (laughs) No. Sorry. There's no harness or anything. So they said, if you're brave enough, walk across the plank. Now, naturally, we all wanted to do it. So actually, in that case, they couldn't pick a leader because everyone was literally queuing up to run across. So we all ran across the plank. No one fell in. Thank God. Then the other challenge, one of them was they took us into this forest and there were these two trees, right? And between the trees was an an electric wire. Yeah, just one single wire. And they said, right, all of your team will start on this side. By the end of this challenge, your entire team needs to be over the other side, Mm -hmm. which means we had to lift each other over this electric wire. So the first person literally had to be chucked over because there's no one to catch them (laughs) the other side. So we found the skinniest person. We just threw them over, (laughs) land on the dirt, right? Then we had to start lifting everyone over. I was the last person. Of course. And I went, I, I was actually used to be high jump champion. Oh, no, I was the second best person in Norfolk at high jump. Do you know that? No, I don't. Right, so I was <laughs> really good at high jump. Anyway, yeah. I high jumped over the, the wire. Yeah. We had loads of different challenges. We had this one challenge where you had literally had to wrestle each other. And then it was like winner stays on. And at the end of this camp, we were like battered and bruised and whatnot. That's when I became head boy. <laughs> Sorry. There's been a huge jump. <laughs> Sorry. So did you wait when you wrestled everyone yeah you a winner yeah yeah I won good yeah uh, but loads of stuff happened I'm trying to remember all the different challenges basically I would always do the challenge and I would always try I got put with like because I was a bit of a nerd but I got put with like the freaks and geeks we were the freaks and geeks mm. and no one expected us to win but you know in movies where you're like you know there's a geek doing like a motivational talk and it's like come on guys we can do this that was me I, I heard you speak about it before and there's this wild story that you mentioned which is someone mm. wiped their watset dust on your afro but you know what those kind of experiences they're very normal like you know that people people with curly hair or people with afro hair like if you get if someone touches it you don't even deem that as any form of racism because it's so normalized within your experience but you know having moved to somewhere like london and heard the stories of my friends here you know i understand certainly that you know I was probably very lucky to have, you know, to, to be mixed because I would have benefited from, you know, uh, you know, there's a light skin privilege that totally exists. In Norwich, where I lived, especially in Framingham and Piggott, there was no people of colour, full stop. So if they saw me, they'll just say you're black, right? Mm. And as such, they would treat me in those ways in, in, in certain instances. So, for example, I remember once I was this guy in my class called Jason and um, <laughs> he had a photographic memory, right? Uh, this is how this exchange went. I held up a calculator to him and I said, Jace, I, I, held, I put nine numbers on a calculator and I went, right, Jason, look at this. And I flashed in front of him and I went, what were the numbers? And he relayed all of them perfectly, right? And I went, Jason, that is so cool. I can't believe you can do that. And he went, yes, I hate you because of your nationality. I was like, I, bro, more time when these kind of things happen, you don't even know what to say because it's just so baffling. Do you know what I mean? Hey, what so, do you say to that? I don't know. I didn't say anything. I just was like, oh, uh, okay. You know, you, I, I wasn't equipped with it. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, like I, you know, I had like, uh, you know, all of the sort of quote unquote, you know, common experience of racism and all of that kind of stuff. To me, does it affect me deeply? Um, maybe, f- yeah, it, may, it makes you conscious of being in your own skin for sure. Mm. Uh, because you're sort of like, you know, this is always sort of, this is a, an un- obscurable factor of me that I, you know, it's something I can't hide about myself, yeah. which I can be, you know, judged about in a certain way. That's just a subconscious thought I have. It's not something that, you know, I walk around with, especially when I hear the stories from my dad's era or I speak to some of my friends and hear what they went through. I think to myself, you know what, come on, you know, try to find a way to deal with what you've experienced. But what I find really interesting uh, from observing Britain and how Britain uh, dissects race or whatever is, <clears throat> you know, 
if I come on a podcast or if I do like a stand up show or whatever, or if I go on a panel show and I mention anything to do with race or a person mentions anything to do with race, you know, people are very quick to to suggest that we're mobilizing the race card. Right. And I remember when I was practicing for my stand up, I watched uh, uh, Lenny Henry live at the Apollo. And all of the comments were about how he was he was making jokes about his race and all of this kind of thing. And they were sort of really chastising him for it. And what's really interesting to me is that, you know, when you, uh, you know, when you are a certain color, all of your experience is dictated by that color. You know, everything from, you know, going to the shops and being followed around or, you know, people asking where you're from or touching your hair or, you know, utilizing certain words against you, whatever, like so much, even, you know, if to use the shop example, you know, if even if the only thing I did in a day or the only thing, you know, a person did in a day was to go and buy a Kit Kat but in going to buy that Kit Kat, they were followed around a shop is an experience that has been solely influenced by race in many instances. And so it's quite difficult oftentimes to talk about race within a medium like stand up or whatever without Mm. mentioning it because all of your experiences change because of it. You going to buy a Kit Kat versus me going to buy a Kit Kat could be totally different only by the fact that we could wear the same clothes totally, and have the same haircut. And only by a factor, uh, by a variable of race could they be different. So of course it's something that we mention more because it has such an influence. Um, it's never, you know, I, I think very rarely is it out of sympathy. But then, because you were experiencing those sort of things, you were in Norfolk, everyone else in the whole place was white. That's, mm. Do you then have to learn how to suppress certain feelings? Well, remember, I'm half white. You know, yeah. I'm mixed. So, you know, part of what my exploration in my stand-up show was, was this ability to, to go between, you know, to know how to do both. You know, people will refer to it as, as code switching and it can happen in many ways. You know, uh, you know, my black friends will talk about how they have to code switch on the phone. You know, they talk about the phone voice, which is what? the voice you want to be. And especially with African parents, you can we, we all laugh about it because you hear them adopt this particular way of speaking. So for me, I actually used to uh, read the dictionary, right, in order to try and learn words and, you know, come across more intelligent in school or whatever or to to be able to play the game that way when I was in lessons and stuff, because I don't know, maybe consciously I didn't know, but subconsciously I think maybe I thought I'll be on the back foot in English school because I think I'm just like, you know, a stupid new kid. So when I would go into lessons, I remember one, my teacher would always say to me, whoa, like your vocabulary is crazy. And it's because in my mind, in my kid brain, that's what I had to do to like, you know, to, to, to blend in seamlessly or to impress, you know, it was to be able to, you know, the expectations I thought they would have of me is that I wouldn't be, you know, equipped with that kind of vocabulary or that ability to speak. So, I mean, you know, that, that's a, that's a sort of unique, because, because what's unique, right, is that you're living your life in Zimbabwe, you're going out on all these adventures, you're having the funnest time. Mm-hmm. And then you come to your new school and where you're meant to just be a kid and you're meant to be mm-hmm. having fun, but actually your homework isn't adventures or doing that. Your homework is trying to survive in this in life mm. I, I think it's incredibly naive right that i i i've just fortunately you haven't experienced that mm. you know in my life because of the color of my skin and look i mean for me personally uh you know there's and maybe this is sort of just classic repression or whatever but those things they don't make me sad you know they don't make me feel any type of way they don't make me feel as though i want any sympathy uh i don't feel any type of way about it i very rarely feel sad about those things you know, if anything, I like to dissect them and tackle them via my satire. That's my outlet. That's my expression. You know, also, these are all one of one experiences by which I mean, you know, a person, another person might have come from Ghana or Nigeria and been like, no, no, I didn't feel the need to learn long words because I was very happy to be unapologetically myself. Um, you know, I felt, you know, being, speaking the way I speak, in the way I speak, if you don't accept it, that's your problem. I totally admire that. And for someone else, that might have been their story. These are just how the various factors that make Munya combined to sort of shape my behavior. And, um, you know, everything brought me to this point. And, um, you know, I learned so much about people through it. And ultimately, it's enabled me to make work that I'm very proud of and, uh, you know, to think in a way that I'm very proud of. So although they may have been hard at the time, I'm quite an um, I'm quite like a what's the word? I'm very oblivious to strong emotions. You know, I try to sort of take everything in my stride um, and embrace it from very far, to, to observe a feeling from very far away, which is why I never cry. I Have never you, cry. Get out of here. 
The only time. What I... about when The Rock left WWE? <laughs> <laughs> there must have been a little moment. That, that, you know what? I I only cry at this is very so. I know exactly the things that make me cry. Number okay. one, I cry at instances of extreme achievement. So, for example, before he went absolutely off the ropes. Conor McGregor had a, a documentary way, you know, well before all these accusations and stuff came out where it tracks his journey through the UFC. And I remember that re for some reason I was watching that back in whenever it was, 2000 and whatnot. But I just started crying. I didn't even know why. And I just tried to, I was with people, so I just tried not to show it, but I couldn't even hold back the tears. And I don't know what, what that was in relation to. I just did. And then um, the other things that make me cry is Up, the movie Up with the balloons. Oh my God. That does make me cry. That's and then, unbelievable. And then, weirdly, it's unbelievable that. Another achievement based one is when I watched Soul, the Disney movie, I think. Yeah, very good. When he's playing on the piano for the first time, he's like doing an audition for, to be part of this band and he's playing on the piano and he enters this flow state and all of the world around him dissolves, whatever. Again, I just started crying and I don't even know why. I think we've all, I think every human has their boulder that they're pushing up all the time. And so when you see that real fight or that real moment within individuals where either they're sort of beaten down, but they're getting back up. And if you've had that sort of fight within you at certain times, that's what triggers it mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. sure. And yeah. it becomes that real emotional moment. Yeah. I mean... <clears throat> Munya's crying. Oh, no, no. <laughs> you know, there's been times that I've tried to cry my hardest and literally not a single tear will fall out. But, you know, also the people that I like, you yeah. know, the, the, you know, when I'm going through tough times, I, I'm always imagining fictional characters like Kratos from God of War. And they're these totally emotionless. Yeah. Now, I know that isn't healthy. That's not healthy. But, but, <laughs> That's but, just suppressing <laughs> Yeah. But I know how to be, I know how to be good uh, to help others with their emotions. I know mm. how to do that. You know, and that's why I say, you know, if I, when I have kids... Uh, I, I, I am totally conscious. I can't create another Munya. I am the way I am because of my dad. And he is the way he is because of his dad. But when I speak to my boys, I have like five of them that I'm so tight with and we've been friends forever. We all say we can't be our dads. We were at, we were at Center Parks in the on-site restaurant eating like a microwave burger. And we decided in that moment, we can't be our dads. We understand why they are the way they are. But we can't continue with that with our kids. We have to listen to them. We have to, when they fall and they cry, we have to say, well, you know, it's okay. You know, you can cry. How hurt are you? Instead of being like, don't cry. So I don't know what that's going to entail for me, but I know that I have to change a lot to get to that point, but I want to change that way. I love that, man. I'm, I, I think that's great advice. Do you know what's so amazing about your career? You leave Sheffield studying psychology. You decide that you want to go into this industry. and But you were told, mm -hmm. unless you had 30,000 followers, you probably wouldn't get an agent. Mm -hmm. So you went, right, I'm going to go and post a video twice a week mm -hmm. on my social media. So you made a video twice a week. I think it was four years or something until mm -hmm. one of them really popped off. Yes. So first of all, to get in that room, I would lie to agents saying that I was Idris Elba's son in the email. <laughs> in the email. Uh, and then oftentimes either they would figure out it was a joke and go, okay, you got me. Like, this is quite interesting. Come in. I want to meet you. Or they'll be like, you know, they would believe I was his son. So I get in there on this one occasion and they're like, look, we really liked your email. It was very smart what you did. Watched your show reel. It was good. You got, you know, you got charisma, you got what it takes, but how many followers do you have? And I was like, oh, I don't know, like 2000. They went, no, no, no. If you had 30,000 followers, maybe we would have connected you to someone in the digital team. So I mentioned this because it's a very important, uh, it's very important within the dissection of what the term influencer means, for example, right? Um, I slightly have beef with the term because I think in many cases it disguises a person's actual talent or skill, right? This is less in reference to me. It's more in terms of my peers even. What do you mean by that? So what I mean by it is this, uh, in press, uh, you know, so, Okay, so thus far, in when I have been reviewed in the press or whatever, um, oftentimes journalists will steer away from calling me a comedian or a satirist, even though that's predominantly what I do. You know, I've been called a YouTuber, despite the fact that I rarely put anything on YouTuber uh, on YouTube. When I went on Bake Off, they described me as a podcaster. I don't even have a podcast, Jamie. <laughs> you know how mad that is? I don't even have a podcast. Are you serious? 
Is that what he said? I've been called a com. Uh, you know, I've been called a rapper, even th- even though you know, rap is sometimes what I do within my satire. And I think, okay, in, and of course, I've been called an influencer, which is interesting to me. Influencer in people's minds is somebody whose only skill is being popular, right? Mm-hmm. That's what the term is used to imply. It's like, Very oh, fair. you're just a popular person. Mm-hmm. However, to gain popularity, especially now, surely requires oftentimes some sort of skill to be amazing at cooking or music or dancing or something to actually entice an audience to go, oh my God, that's amazing. I want to I want to invest in that. I want to follow in that. And so, you know, what we're really, what we're really talking about is wh- what does a person do beneath the label of influencer that we are not calling them? So... You know, for example, there's a there's a girl called I think Poppy Cooks who, you know, her specialism is recipes involving potatoes, mm. and she is sick. Yeah, she can do a million and one things. Yeah, but people call her an influencer. She's a chef. She was a chef before she was making potatoes as well. She's a chef now. Call her a chef. Ditto with a musician. Ditto with a dancer. With a whatever. Just because oftentimes the only reason people want followers is so that they are then afforded the opportunities to do the things they want to do. The only thing that ever made me want followers is an agent saying, you can't present until you have followers. If she had said to me in that moment, you can present, I would have done it without followers. See what I'm saying? Mm. The only thing that gave me a desire to be popular is being told it is a prerequisite to do the thing you want to do and love to do. So the term is slightly reductionist in that it actually buries the talent that somebody has used to acquire their audience. And also, you know, we have to say that if anyone had, if, if someone said to you, I'm going to do a show in a minute and there's going to be 10,000 people there, you'd be like, bloody hell. Like, who are you? That's incredible. Those are the kind of numbers that people are building every day behind, you know, their talent. And so it's worth actually giving it its dues and saying, cool, what, what is it you do? And I want to acknowledge you for that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. But again, goes back to that same sort of thing that we like to put people in some sort of box because it's easier for mm. us to articulate it then. Mm. You know, you are a comedian and your videos are so smart. When I first did Radio 1, mm. is, I don't think you even know this, but I can't wait to tell you. In Radio 1, because it's a very live show, as you know, it's every day, people are constantly thinking on their toes of what to talk about and what to do. The producer at the time would say, right, let's go and check out Munir's social media. He'll tell us what's going on. He's like, guys. So they would go and check out what you, <laughs> right. you, you were talking about. <laughs> right, right. To use that kind of vibe to help with what kind of conversations we should have on Radio 1. Oh, that's crazy. Without you realising, I think, you're influencing so many people on because you're spreading information in an entertaining way, mm. which is actually what people really want to engage with. That's why podcasting is quite a good thing. If you can make it entertaining and informational at the same time, you kind of got this great blend of something going on. Mm-hmm. And that's what you do so well. How long does it take you to write and create and direct those videos? Well, first of all, you know, I, re- I really appreciate the compliment, you know, especially, it, you know, I, I really appreciate it. And also when I meet people and they say, you know, they, they say to me, look, I know you don't want to hear this, but I think your videos are da da da. I always am so grateful for anyone who watches a video because, you know, it's just, it, 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 you know, it's just my dream. So I, I take every compliment at face value, full value. So I appreciate that. Um, in terms of how long it takes me to make a video, um, some days you just wake up and you just know, you know, really? you just know exactly that the, the idea just carries you straight to where it wants to go and you, and you execute it and it's just seamless other days you really have to wrestle with ideas. You know, they will torment you and they will torture you. What's also really interesting to me or what I value most about creating satire is sometimes I go on a streak of videos where they're not really related to anything. You know, that it, it might be about what happens when you skip leg day or whatever. And it's like just fun. And I remember, oh my God, you can make things just because they're fun and like there's no consequence to you. and <laughs> There's no danger. But that doesn't really bring me satisfaction if I do it long term. I like to do something that really holds up a mirror and makes people ask about us as a society. For instance, two videos which, you know, had uh, real discourse in the comments and to a degree, not even, well, for some people, backlash. One I made about Andrew Tate, right? This is really early on in his conception where I just knew this is not a good man. He's not a good person. And I did a video expressing as such via the medium of the Andrew Tate modern. I think it was like this fake museum I'd invented. And, you know, people were like, I I loved you up until now, but Andrew's spreading a good message. Da, da, da. This is before all the human trafficking investigations, Are you by sure the way. It was, it was that thick in the comments, like that 
that's what people were saying. They were like, you know, this is how we know we've sold out to the Western media or whatever. I'm thinking, bro, I can't even, about Western media, I can't even get to Soho House. What are you on about, you nutcase? <laughs> right? <laughs> then similarly, uh, with the, uh, I made a video very recently about, you know, Russell Brand and, and what felt like to me a convenient conversion in the face of some very serious allegations. And, you know, lo and behold, in the comments, it was like, you know, uh, you know people were, were, were getting into it and fighting each other and stuff, talking about whether, you know, religion should be used as like a, a veil and, and all of these kind of things. And in those situations, my job is not to go and slog it out in the comment section. I'm just providing a stimulus upon which to have a conversation. And that is very valuable to me. Um, it's, it's, it's encouraging us to think about these kind of things. You know, it's encouraging us to, to discuss some of the institutions which previously we have just been told, you know, just allow them to exist and don't ask any questions. I, I want people to ask questions. I want people to ask questions about politics and to question their beliefs and what they stand for because ultimately through discourse, you'll either change them or you'll strengthen them. And I think that's to the benefit of society. So I like to provoke conversation more than I like to be popular, if that makes sense. If you were to do this kind of satire and these kind of things on, I don't know, let's uh, SNL mm. or so, you, 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 you kind of separate it. Oh, mm. SNL mm. are going to get the sort of comments. Not you as the comedian or individual, it's SNL. Because it's on your own personal page, it's about you. So there has to be a, a slight combination between, okay, I've got this big following. Am I worried now I'm going to alienate some people because then maybe people stop liking me? But also I want to um, produce content that uh, that sparks this conversation and I want to do stuff that I think is right. So it must be a hard kind of mm. road to follow. It's a very good point about the SNL thing. Um, you know, maybe I would, if there was an SNL here, maybe I would have never started to make my own things. But in relation to what you're saying, if I make a video and people unfollow me because they don't like what I am, you know, what I'm, uh, the message I'm putting in the video, there's a few things to consider. First of all, as a innate psychologist and also as a satirist, what I believe my role is, is to often reflect how we are feeling together, how we are, how most of us are feeling. Same way as a political cartoonist will often do, you know, I love Ben Jennings who, you know, if you've not seen him, you can check him out. He's like sort of similar age to me. He does really bang on the money political cartoons and his job is even harder than mine because he needs to in a single image capture everything and i just think he's 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 just totally incredible but i'm 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 studying constantly how people feel before i t i i load up the bone arrow right so when i take the shot i already know by and large i'm trying to em encapsulate how many people are feeling right as opposed to just putting out something that I know is going to alienate people, if that makes sense. Mm. So that's the first thing. Number two, I check every video and I send to my manager and I send to the same group of friends to number one, ask, is this funny? Number two, is this, you know, is this inoffensive? And when I say inoffensive, what I mean is I don't want to, I don't want to hurt anyone. I, I'm not a malicious person. Mm. It's not in my interest to cause any form of harm to anyone. And I care more about not harming people than I do being liked, if that makes sense. And mm. that, that translates as I could have a video that I think is hilarious and I don't care if people are hurt by it and I just put it out. I'm never going to do that. I'm always going to check first. So that's the second layer of defense. Thirdly, if a video goes out and someone goes, look, I'm going to follow you because I don't like what you're saying about Rishi Sunak and I don't like what you're saying about Russell Brand and I really like Andrew Tate. That's fine. I don't, I'm, I'm not in a race to become the most followed person. All I want to do is leave a body of work that was challenging and that meant something and that inspired some sort of change. That's what all that matters to me. Do you think human satire is a good vehicle to um, land a message? Of course. It's like the, I, this phrase, I think I must have invented it by now. It's like putting the medicine in the lasagna, right? <laughs> if, <laughs> if I said, do you want lasagna? Nine out of 10 people in this room, bar the psychopaths, would say yes, right? So if I need you to eat lasagna, if I if you're a kid and I need you to eat medicine or vitamins or whatever, I'm just going to put it in the lasagna. This is a Trojan horse. Some people might refer to it as, but if you want people it's to understand, very good analogy. If you want people to understand something, humor is a language we all speak and enjoy speaking, right? And that's why in something as intensive as you know uh, a documentary about North Korea and Kim Jong Un, which are extremely ominous topics. You're talking about people, you know, depressed under uh, suppressed under a dictatorship, somebody who could literally end the, the world with the press of a button. I have to put sketches and songs in there because otherwise, why was a British person scrolling their TV guide if they even watch TV? Going to go, 
let me watch a documentary about a group of people who are having a much harder life than I am. How do you get them to care? How do you get a person to care who has everything? So it's like, cool, if I can communicate through song and through satire and make you laugh, hopefully through that you will absorb some of the other messages. So in my own experience, comedy is a great communicator. Man, yeah, it's amazing. And you know what's crazy? What? This is how I know I'm going to be back on the podcast. I didn't even have to tell the dog story. Oh no! No, I'm not no. telling it. I'm not telling it because he's no. already wrapped. He's already wrapped the no. podcast. We've got eight questions. No, no, no. Wrapped. Yeah, you have to wait. No. So what happened to the dog? No, no, no. I'm not telling you now. Shit! No, people are gonna as, be... a, as a presenter, your job was to remember that. Fuck. So you have to get me back on one day. Please, everyone, guess in the comments what it was. Muni, mean, we like to end with eight questions. You ready for this? Yeah. What's a saying or phrase that always makes you smile or cheers you up? My wife. That's mine. Is that yours? Yeah. Best compliment anyone's ever given you. Oh, I love it when I go to people I'm five foot seven and they go nah that makes me feel good because I'm very strongly five foot seven what scares you most about yourself so if my brain wanted to roast me it could literally destroy me wow good it's one too, it's too it's too strong that's my favorite answer about that one I'm, I'm similar great answer and I think mm. a lot of people relate to that yeah brain can be so overpowering sometimes oh, yeah, yeah. and you have to fight it a lot like even just you know this morning I was just sleeping yeah and um I was just about to wake up, but my brain was sort of awake and it was like, bro, like, what did you actually really achieve this year? Shut I was up. like, bro, <laughs> I woke up and I was like, did anyone hear that? Last time you cried and why? Last time I cried was probably watching up, but <laughs> okay. also the last time I cried actually was when I was writing an article about my old neighbor, Peter, who is still alive, but I've moved recently. Mm -hmm. And Peter is like, Bro, everyone knows Peter yeah, in South London. He's got this amazing garden. Bro, this guy literally roasts me every time I walk past his house, yeah? And um, basically, he became like my, without me knowing, he became like one of my best friends in the neighborhood because whenever I saw him, I'd stop and I'd have these super long conversations with him where he would tell me like stories about the war or stories about mad stuff that he's done. And then when I moved... I was asked to write an article about London and like something, just anything to do with London. And I ended up writing about Peter. And when I was writing this article, I just literally started crying because I realized that Peter was basically like my granddad. Yeah. And my granddad passed away in lockdown. And so I never really got to say bye to him. I went to see him at the start of lockdown and he basically had, you know, a tumor in his throat. So he couldn't speak to me anymore. So I couldn't even hear him speak. So... When I, when he passed away, like I didn't see him, I never heard from him again. So, and I didn't feel any emotion about it because obviously like in my mind, if I go back to Derby, I might still see him, right? But he's gone. So when I'm writing this article about Peter, I'm like, oh my God, like I realized that the reason that I'm taking all this time to speak to this guy is because I think he's my granddad. Like, you know, he's everything that I could have said to my granddad, all the stories I could have told to him. So that was the last time I cried when I was writing that article. It's amazing, man. That's amazing. What's something you can't let go of? Something I can't let go of. Donuts, man. Because banging. I used to have a you know, I used to get in trouble at work because one day my boss saw found uh, he saw me like close my drawer quickly and then he opened it and I had had like a stash of donuts that I would eat like a squirrel <laughs> underneath the desk. Like so squirrel. I keep telling people that I'm healthy now, but if I walk past any donut shop, I have to eat donuts. Man, glazed donuts. Yeah. What's something you'd be embarrassed for people to know you like or want? Oh, I love the Pussycat Dolls. No cap. I love the Pussycat Dolls. Only one album though, which is PCD. And I love the tune, I Don't Need a Man. Uh, just like the beat of that is just crazy. For real, bro. How I'll does it go again? That. Sing it. What is it goes, it? I don't need a man to make it happen. I get up doing my thing. And I just hear that. I'm just like, you know what? Go for it. Go off. What turns you off? Turns me off. Um, obviously dogs, like I said. <laughs> but also, man... I'll tell you what's a big ick. If I was a girl, this would be my ick. You know when guys are moving around and then their shoe squeaks on the floor? <laughs> yeah. Bro, I think, why is your shoe breaking in front of me? <laughs> that puts me off when I hear shoes squeak. I'm like, it's so embarrassing. You've just pierced the silence with your squeak. <laughs> so good. <laughs> so good. What turns you on? When I go in and there's no dogs. Um... <laughs> oh, no, cool facts. I love facts. Oh my, you like facts? I love a fact. Oh man, I, I can I can spill some off for you big time. Like, um, okay, uh, supposedly, this is a great one. Supposedly why the Apple logo is the Apple logo. Mm -hmm. So Alan Turing, the, he invented the first computer. Mm -hmm. He's an amazing guy, incredible guy. 
he was gay and he got caught and he had a choice of being chemically castrated or being put in prison. I mean, just a terrible mm. thing back in the day. So he chose chemical castration because he wanted to still work on his computers. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they this, this sent him completely loopy, completely mad, and uh, he took his own life. Mm. But he didn't want his mother to know, so he made it look like an accident. So he injected an apple with cyanide and took a bite out of it. That's oh, why Steve wow. Jobs called Apple in respect of Alan Turing and made the first computer. That's crazy. That's a brilliant That's fact. a good one, right? I was going to say that there are no nerve endings in the flappy bit of your elbow. So if right now, as you're listening, you grab the tip of your elbow with it straight, so the, the skin, and squeeze it as hard as you can and pinch it, you can't feel a thing. That's a good one. What do you like most about yourself? Uh, I like my brain. Mm -hmm. I like my eyebrows. Yeah, they're good. You know, I'm just used to them. Yeah, I like my brain and my eyebrows. It's a great combination. And I like being able to jump so high. Imagine that. I was once the second best person in Norfolk at high jump. Do you not bloom there was no one better than me in Norfolk. Well, one person better than me in the whole of Norfolk. That's crazy. Do you not blew my mind the other day? Mm. You and I, or everyone in this room, we were once the youngest person in the world. Nah, it's, it's not true. It is true. It's not true because at any given second, there are multiple babies being born. Not, no, not as... To Every phone. time I click my finger, a baby's been born, but yeah. like two. As I took my first breath, not at the same time. I will try and do stuff that means I'm the only person doing it in the world at that one time. Like what? Like doing that, the crab. <laughs> Favorite swear word? I don't even really swear that much. That's a good thing. I say like, um, you don't have to say anything. One that really baffles people is when you say because it because it's so childish and it's a huge ick. But if something mad happens and you go, oh pants. <laughs> <laughs> Last one. What happened to the dog? Nah. No. Can't no. tell you. It's gonna be your next one. It's gotta be in the next one, man. Thank you so much for great company. Thanks amazing. for having me, Jamie. <laughs> Appreciate you. Make sure you watch the doc. Yeah, watch the doc.